all the kitchen scraps for lepers and orphans. No more merciful beheadings. And call off Christmas. Good evening, and that was Ebenezer Scrooge, Sheriff of Nottingham. Call off Christmas indeed. Well, at least Robin Hood put an end to that nasty little wheeze. And so here we all are as usual. Top trousers are button undone, temples gently throbbing, looking rather less fit than what's left of the turkey and slumped in our traditional post-festive torpor. So as we approach the end of a year which I imagine most of us will be glad to see the back of, the year of the Gulf War, the massacre of the Kurds, appalling upheavals in Eastern Europe, and a recession that is about to end, or alternatively not, depending on which politicians you disbelieve most, let's seek a little light relief in the cinema. This is the programme in which, among other things, I give you in no kind of order whatsoever my choice of the ten best films of the year. And we'll start with Jean-Paul Rapineau's splendidly vivid and lively Cyrano de Bergerac, with witty subtitles by Anthony Burgess, and best of all, a superb performance by Gérard Depardieu, as the dashingly romantic soldier poet whose love life was blighted by the length of his nose and whose wooing of the lovely Roxanne had perforce to be done by proxy. Ma pauvre enfant, vous qui n'aimez que beau langage, bel esprit. Si c'était un profane, un sauvage Non. Tous les mots qu'il dit sont fins, je le devine. Oui. Tous les mots sont fins quand la moustache est fine. Et si c'était un saut Eh bien, je mourrais là. Vous m'avez fait venir pour me dire cela Je n'en sens pas très bien l'utilité, madame. Non, écoutez. Quelqu'un m'a mis la mort dans l'âme en me disant que tous vous êtes tous gascons dans votre compagnie. Et que nous provoquons tous les blancs becs qui sont là par faveur Oui, j'ai très peur pour lui. Non, sans raison. Mais j'ai songé en vous voyant hier tenant tête à ces brutes. Vous, invincible et grand, tel que toujours vous fûtes. J'ai songé, s'il voulait, lui, que tous ils craindront. C'est bien. Je défendrai votre petit baron. Oh, n'est-ce pas que vous allez me le défendre J'ai toujours eu pour vous une amitié si tendre. Oui, oui. Vous serez son ami Je le serai. Et jamais il n'aura de duel C'est juré. Oh, je vous aime bien. Il faut que je m'en aille. Mais vous ne m'avez pas raconté la bataille de cette nuit. Vraiment, ça dut être inouï. Dites-lui qu'il m'écrive. Oh, je vous aime. Oui, oui. Cent hommes contre vous. Allons à Dieu. Nous sommes de grands amis. Oui, oui. Qu'il m'écrive. Cent hommes. Vous me direz plus tard, maintenant je ne puis. Cent hommes, quel courage. Oh. J'ai fait le puits. Oh, foolish, misguided girl. In this year's Oscars, Serrano was nominated for Best Foreign Film and Depardieu for Best Actor. In the event, neither of them won. Largely, I suspect, because around voting time, an American magazine alleged that aged nine, Depardieu had taken part in a rape. He's denied it vigorously ever since, but the damage was done. Nobody was going to risk offending America's militant feminists by taking Depardieu's word and giving him a prize. During the year, however, he could also be seen in the French film Uranus and in Peter Weir's charming green card. And in my view, he ranks with Robert De Niro as the best screen actor in the world right now. De Niro, too, was impressive, both in Awakenings and as a movie director suspected of communist sympathies in Guilty by Suspicion. But the man of the year was neither of these. He was instead Kevin Costner. Not only was Costner the Robin Hood Prince of Thieves who stopped Sheriff Alan Rickman calling off Christmas, but he was also the star and Oscar-winning director of that bold, epic western, Dances with Wolves. And it's this that I include as the second of my ten films of the year. She's hurt. She's hurt. La Rouge Deal! La Rouge Deal! No, she's hurt. 
You know, every year after this annual Roundup program, I get letters from confused people who even now are probably sitting there alternating sips of port with mouthfuls of bismuth, saying, yes, it's all very well, but I don't understand which exactly were your top ten films. So this time, let's make it absolutely clear. I've put forward two films so far, and I'll signpost the others as they come along, OK? So now I shall confuse you even further by offering another top ten, not my choice, but yours. Here with the list of the ten most popular films at the box office in 1991. At ten, The Commitments, Alan Parker's funny, energetic story of a Dublin soul band. Nine, Kindergarten Cop, omnipresent Arnie faces this toughest assignment yet. Eight, Naked Gun, two and a half, Leslie Nielsen and company with more crazy antics from the police squad files. Seven is Sleeping with the Enemy, psycho spouse Patrick Bergen stalks terrorised wife Julia Roberts. Six, Dances with Wolves, soldier Costner in a quest to find the frontier and himself. Five, Home Alone, an abandoned kid battles with burglars in this appallingly successful comedy. Four, three men and a little lady, the doting dad's thrown into disarray when mother and daughter leave for England. At three, the silence of the lambs, of which we'll hear a little more in a minute. Two is Terminator 2, yes, Arnie again, this time as a robot, come to save mankind. And the number one film, Robin Hood, Prince of Thieves, Kevin Costner, hits the box office bullseye to round off his own spectacular year. And now for film number three in my list. The cinema this year seems to have found itself morbidly fascinated by the phenomenon of the serial killer. Well, we had plenty of that during the 80s, of course, with all those slasher movies, the Halloweens, the Nightmares on Elm Street, the Friday the 13th and the like. But this year's crop tended to treat the serial killer rather more seriously. Two films on the subject, the French Dr. Petiot and the American Henry Portrait of a Serial Killer, were based loosely on fact. In Fear, which had only the most tenuous grasp on reality, Ali Sheedy played a psychic who tracks down serial killers. But the most effective and most spectacular specimen of the genre was the totally fictional The Silence of the Lambs, in which apprentice FBI agent Jodie Foster seeks the help of twisted murderous genius Anthony Hopkins in hunting another serial killer known as Buffalo Bill. Oh, Agent Starling, you think you can dissect me with this blonde little tool? No. I, I, I thought that your knowledge... You're so ambitious, aren't you? You know what you look like to me with your good bag and your cheap shoes? You look like a rube. A well-scrubbed, hustling rube with a little taste. Good nutrition's given you some length of bone, but you're not more than one generation from poor wire trash, are you, Agent Starling? And that accent you've tried so desperately to shed, pure West Virginia. What is your father to you? Is he a coal miner? Does he stink of the land? You know how quickly the boys found you. All those tedious, sticky fumblings in the back seats of cars while you could only dream of getting out, getting anywhere, getting all the way to the end. You see a lot, Doctor. But are you strong enough to point that? high powered perception at yourself what about it why don't you why don't you look at yourself and write down what you say or maybe you're afraid to a census taker once tried to test me i ate his liver with some fava beans and a nice chianti
If Foster is not nominated as Best Actress and if Hopkins doesn't win the Academy Award for Best Supporting Actor next year, it can only mean that by comparison with Oscar voters, butterflies have the memories of elephants. Now, one of the most worrying aspects of the year, especially as far as Hollywood is concerned, is that for the first time the cinema has not shown itself to be recession-proof. In the Depression era of the 1930s, people escaped their worries by flocking to the movies, but this year they've been staying away, very possibly wasting their spare cash on luxuries like food. From New York, Tom Brook reports. These are hard times in Hollywood. The stars still go out, not to lavish premieres, but to what resembles a soup kitchen for a plate of rice and cup of water. <laughs> <laughs> this was all part of a publicity gimmick, a Hollywood hunger banquet to dramatize the inequity of the world's food distribution. It makes you understand that there's more to life than, uh, you know, the billions of dollars that they say are being lost in, in the film industry. Indeed, it's not world famine that's rocked Hollywood this year, but the recession. Even those stars with big hits have noticed that overall box office attendance in 1991 declined. Nobody's got any money. That's pretty <laughs> simple. Yeah, I mean, there's such a, a, a dichotomy going on right now, particularly in America. The rich are terribly rich. The poor are terribly poor. There's no middle class anymore. Uh, I don't think it's just Hollywood. I think it's, um, I, I think it's everywhere. With hard times, thousands have found they can't afford to go to the movies. I think movies are ridiculously expensive. <laughs> People in the film industry have always liked to tell themselves that the film industry is depression-proof and recession-proof, and this is perhaps the first time when that's not been the case. So I think that has added a great deal to the nervousness of a lot of the executives around, that all of a sudden everyone is vulnerable, all the old assumptions are off. What about this? Studios began to consider that the audience was maybe staying away because many movies were badly conceived. There were some out-and-out -out disasters, like Hudson Hawk. There's a growing perception that too many films are being developed on a corporate whim by executives with half-baked ideas. Well, I think it's important to a lot of people that you know they're, they're to hang on to their jobs, and they hang on to their jobs by having things called ideas. You know, I had a great idea this morning. Oh, yeah, what was yours? This was mine. And then some, somehow you've got a movie at the end of that. Unhappy, darling. After a dull year, the Christmas season, a time when Hollywood traditionally earns a big share of overall revenue, brought great expectations. The season got off to an excellent start with the Adams Family. The arrival of Spielberg's Hook generated great interest, but its early performance at the box office wasn't as strong as expected. Despite a last-minute flurry of excitement over the heavily promoted Christmas movies, the prevailing mood at many of the big Hollywood studios this year has been one of gloom and doom. With box office attendance down, the high spending days of the 1980s appear to be over. Studios are cutting costs, and the new order of the day in Hollywood is to make everything lean and mean. Everyone is in Hollywood perceives themselves as born-again cost cutters, but the, the proof of the pudding will ultimately be in the results. The big studios have nervously noted that the money makers of 1991, the blockbusters, City Slickers, Terminator 2, and Robin Hood all came from the leaner, independent production companies. If we believe in a film, we go make it. And we don't look for board approval. We don't, we don't look to, uh, to pass it through five or six or four layers of bureaucracy. Studios have been trying to cut back bureaucracy, and people are losing their jobs. It's uh, uh, sometimes a very devastating emotional experience. This top Hollywood headhunter had to install extra filing cabinets to house the hundreds of letters he receives each week from people laid off by the recession. I have never seen it quite as bad as this one. One studio, Orion Pictures, has just filed for bankruptcy protection. Another spent the year narrowly avoiding going under. Others have parent companies overwhelmed by debt. With box office in decline and production costs skyrocketing, studio chiefs are more than a little jittery. As the pictures they've spent money on are about to be released, they're nervous wrecks. They're, they feel terrible. They're, they're, they're sleep anxiety. They, they look terrible, and, and uh, you can feel the pressure. Those in front of the camera are going to have to take a pay cut, too. But it's not going to affect megastars like Arnold Schwarzenegger or Julia Roberts, despite her lackluster year. For actors, producers, writers, and directors who are in that awkward middle ground where they, they've coattailed up the price structure, 
but haven't really delivered the uh, commensurate value. For those people, I think their prices are already being cut. The one encouraging thing that can come out of this period of uncertainty is that they're no longer uh, proven examples to follow. They're not cranking out sequels to every movie that comes out now. I think they're going to have to look harder to find uh, interesting material to make films out of. And um, that's the one hope I get out of this uh, period of uh, gloom and doom. And a fair bit of gloom around, as you can see. There are even rumors circulating that some Hollywood movie makers have been reduced to taking their mistresses off the payroll. On the brighter side, however, this has been a pretty good year for actresses. In an unusual number of films, not all of them much cop admittedly, women have been the protagonists, while men have taken the customary female role of flapping their hands in the background. Pictures that come to mind include postcards from The Edge with Meryl Streep and Shirley MacLaine, The Grifters with Angelica Houston and Annette Bening, Sleeping with the Enemy, not much of a movie, but a strong central role for Julia Roberts, Woody Allen's Alice starring Mia Farrow, Mermaids with Cher and Winona Ryder, Rambling Rose with Laura Dern, and Glenn Close in David Putnam's ambitious Euro production, Meeting Venus. But the best of them was Thelma and Louise, in which Susan Sarandon and Gina Davis set out for a weekend break on the run from domestic boredom and finish up on the run from the law. It frightened the life out of American men who simply can't come to terms with the alarming idea that women might choose to control their own destinies without any help from someone in trousers. Thelma and Louise is the fourth film in my top ten. out of that girl, put it in a paper bag. Yes, ma'am. You're going to have an amazing story to tell all your friends. If not, you'll have a tag on your toe. You decide. All right, hurry up. Let's go. Ma'am, would you be quiet, sir? Sit down, please. Thank you. Just stay there. Just get real comfortable. Hey, uh, I'll get some bottles of wild turkey, too, will you? Yes, ma'am. Now you get down, too? Yes, ma'am. Ladies and gentlemen, Thank you all for your cooperation. Now stay down on the floor till I'm gone. Have a good day. Jesus Christ. Good God. My Lord. Well, that film was directed by Ridley Scott, who is British, and indeed British directors and performers have done rather well this year. Not in Britain, of course. We don't really have a film industry in Britain, but in America. Kenneth Branagh went there to direct and star in Dead Again. Stephen Frears made The Grifters. John Schlesinger made Pacific Heights. Adrian Lyne made Jacob's Ladder, while Michael Caton Jones directed Michael J. Fox in Doc Hollywood, and Mick Jackson was Steve Martin's director for L.A. Story. On the other side of the camera, Jeremy Irons was in Reverse of Fortune, Anthony Hopkins starred in Desperate Hours as well as The Silence of the Lambs, and Timothy Dalton appeared in Rocketeer. Albert Finney starred in Miller's Crossing, and Sean Connery in Highlander 2, though he might want to forget that. Lenny Henry, Rick Mayle and Robbie Coltrane also made movies in America with, let us tactfully say, for this is still the season of goodwill, varying degrees of success. But for me and Hopkins apart, the British actor of the year is Alan Rickman, who turned up just about everywhere. Just a minute. Robin Hood steals money from my pocket, forcing me to hurt the public. And they love him for it. Some men are born in the wrong century. I think I was born on the wrong continent. So who is it? You tell me. I don't know. I don't believe that. Look, if this is a problem, these are my friends, Nina. No, okay, I'll send them away, sure. 
I think Alan Rickman acted the socks off Costner in Robin Hood, though I did say at the time that his over-the-top performance really belonged in a different film. So when I met him in Water Street the other day and told him I admired his work, he called me a liar. Well, now I'm here to prove him wrong. But let's move on to my choice of film number five, The Commitments, which by nice coincidence was also made by British director Alan Parker, though once again with American money. It's the story of the brief, hilarious but inglorious career of an Irish soul band in Dublin. <laughs> sort of stuff. I can sing anything. It's not the same. It's how he does it. The showmanship. Brilliant. I'm not doing that. I need to help myself. He's hurt. Look, they're helping him off. What will they do now? Bring on a substitute. It's the act, lads. Watch. Five minutes, Jimmy, and you have to how go. How are you gorgeous? That one's short. That's what you've got to measure up to, lads. Do you not think, uh... What? Well, like, maybe we're a little white for that kind of thing. Do you not get it, lads? The Irish are the blacks of Europe, and Dubliners are the blacks of Ireland, and the Northside Dubliners are the blacks of Dublin. So say it once, say it loud. I'm black and I'm proud. Well, now, at this vaguely halfway point, let's look back over the movie news of the year. Well, this is as high as it goes. I mean, this has been a month of awards. I was prepared, but always surprised. And after that sad list of the late greats, perhaps we should all cheer ourselves up. Time enough later, I trust, to contemplate our own mortality. So pop another Rennie in your mouth while we turn to comedy. In a year in which, as a matter of fact, good comedy has been pretty thin on the ground, here's a brief compilation of some of the funnier moments from the movies. Is this made from real lemons? Yes. I only like all natural fruits and beverages, organically grown, with no preservatives. 
Are you sure they're real lemons? Yes. Well, I'll tell you what. I'll buy a cup if you buy a box of my delicious Girl Scout cookies. Do we have a deal? Are they made from real Girl Scouts? Ask me, Father, for I have sinned. It's been a month since my last confession. I've been with this band, and there's been a lot of cursing and blasphemy. And I've been neglecting my exams. And it's these three girls with the band. I've had lustful thoughts about all of them. And when I studied, I used to sing hymns. Now I'm always humming When a Man Loves a Woman by Marvin Gaye. Percy and... Sledge. Huh? It was Percy Sledge to that particular song. Thanks, Thanks for having us. I was really oh, generous. Sure. We, Thanks for coming. We thought it was neat. Yeah. <laughs> neat? Yeah, really neat, yeah. No one's ever described it quite that way. Hi. Yeah. Hi. Okay. Have fun tonight. Thank you. Well, I don't think we'll be making that other deal. Oh, really? Not yeah. neat enough for you? Not well. <laughs> not, not quite. No, no. It's, it's, we've got to put the kids... we got to get, get with the kids. Okay. So I'm going to give them this. All right. Thanks. Neat. Anybody who says my show is neat has to go. You're just jealous. No, no. I could never be a woman because I just stay home and play with my breasts all day. Oh, Frank, we're no good together. All you ever lived for was your police work. And you were always busy trying to save the end zone layer. Ozone layer. Oh, Frank, you never tried to understand. How can you say that? When I sank every penny I had into buying that 1,000 acres of Brazilian rainforest. Then I had it slashed and burned so we could build our dream house. Frank, how could you be so insensitive? Insensitive? You think it's easy displacing an entire tribe? I said we're closed, Bozo. I wouldn't. And that's Mr. Bozo, OK? So, yeah, that's right. It ain't quite closing time yet. You, let's not mess with me today, okay? I'm robbing the bank. What the hell kind of clown are you? The crying on the inside kind, I guess. <laughs> God, that's loud. My air canals are very sensitive. They're stainless steel. Took a bullet at Corregidor. Passed straight through. Here, look at this. Huh? We have these to hold down the sound, sir. Oh, good. Thanks. Do us good. He was hanging the help. He was helping us. This guy is not normal, I'm telling you. Did you see his eyes? He's got crazy eyes. He's a lunatic. I'm telling you, we are going into the wilderness being led by a lunatic. He's behind me, isn't he? And that last bit was my favorite individual moment of the year. Time now, though, to get back to my personal choice. So here is film number six, Misery, which is based on the Stephen King novel and starred Academy Award winner Kathy Bates as the demented fan who kidnaps her favorite author, James Kahn, after he's been injured in a car crash and inflicts upon him such physical indignities as make your eyes water even to think about them. You. You, dirty bird. How could you? She can't be dead. Misery Chastain cannot be dead. Annie, in 1871, women often died in childbirth. But her spirit is the important thing, and Misery's spirit is still alive. I don't want her dead! I want her! And you murdered her! No! I didn't. Who did? No one. She she died. She just slipped away. Slipped away? Slipped away? She didn't just slip away. You did it. 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 You, did it. you murdered my misery. Annie. Annie. I thought you were good, Paul. But you're not good. You're just another lying old dirty birdie. And I don't think I'd better be around you for a while. And don't even think about anybody coming for you. Not the doctors. Not your agent. Not your family. Because I never called them. Nobody knows you're here. 
And you better hope nothing happens to me. Because if I die, you die. Right, then six down, four to go, so let's follow up swiftly with my film number seven. This is Sidney Lumet's Q&A. Nick Nolte is the super-bent New York supercop who commits a murder and claims it was self-defence. Timothy Hutton is the young district attorney who conducts the Q&A, the question and answer, and slowly unravels a violent, exciting and utterly murky web of political corruption among New York's finest. <laughs> You're not the man your father was, Riley. You saved him with his shoe flies and the rats. You don't love cops, Riley. I love my father, Mike. Oh, Riley, you just love the idea of your father. Now, your father was dirty. He was dirty as a gum. Nothing big, just penny any stuff. You know, free meals, place to coop. For a while, he was a bad man or about bad in the South Bronx. The normal stuff, he took home 100, 150 a week, that's all. Well, what a cop. I mean, like me, he was the first to the door, the window, the skylight. I mean, he knew there was animals out there. He knew there was a line that the niggers, the spits, the junkies, the faggots had to cross to get at the people's throats. He was that line. I am that line. And the judges, the Jew lawyers, the Alderman, the Guinea DAs are raking it in hell. And we take a hamburger and it's goodbye badge, gun and pension. And all the time, it's our life that's on the line, and it's our widows and our orphans. Now you road cop, you mick bastard! You went from our side to their side! Hey, Mike! Right, now, in among the odd gleam of gold, what about all the dross that came our way during 1991? The common currency of cinema, as of television, books, theatre, music and everything else, is indeed dross. It's not intentional, it's just the way things turn out. Ultimately, a first-rate idea is only as good as the third-rate minds that turn it into a movie. So now I offer you my alternative ten, my list in ascending order of lack of merit of the total duds of 1991. <laughs> At ten, the rookie, Clint Eastwood, as an aged cop who should have been left to enjoy his bus pass in peace. Nine, Rocky Five. It's official. Rocky has brain damage, and so after this garbage does the audience. Eight, Life Stinks. Mel Brooks patronises the unemployed, the unemployable, and the mentally disturbed. Number seven, Omen Four. The devil is female, aged eight, and menstruates. All the evils of the world are caused by PMT. At six, Curly Sue, even gooier, even yuckier, even more sentimental than Home Alone. I rest my case. Five, look who's talking to. Look if you must, but do yourself a favour. Don't listen, because there's nothing to hear. Number four, drop dead Fred. Yes, Fred, please. Three, Problem Child, a truly unpleasant movie that seeks to extract mirth from the problems of a disturbed kid. Two Men at Work, a classic example of inspiration drying up before they wrote the script. But at number one, the undefeated, undisputed turkey of the year, Bonfire of the Vanities, Treat a la Mode de Hollywood. Dear, oh dear. A very bad year for Bruce Willis. Twelve months ago, he was a superstar after Die Hard 2. Now, what with Bonfire of the Vanities and Hudson Hawk, and I'm still not sure how I left that out of my list of the ten worst, he's rapidly becoming Bruce who? Charlie Sheen's not exactly laughing either. The Rookie, Men at Work and Navy Seals. Three turkeys, trussed and oven dressed. Whatever did happen to Charlie Sheen? A bad year too for 1990's golden girl Julia Roberts. Twelve months ago, she was everyone's idea of a pretty woman. Now, after sleeping with the enemy and dying young, she has it all to prove again. Though by all accounts she's made a bit of a comeback as Tinkerbell in Steven Spielberg's Hook. Nevertheless, one year can bring a short, sharp shock in the movies. On a more encouraging note, 1991 also saw the emergence in significant numbers of black filmmakers led by Spike Lee with Jungle Fever and John Singleton with Boys in the Hood. But there are also movies like Hanging with the Homeboys, New Jack City and A Rage in Harlem, as well as the anglo ghanaian Armour and in Britain, Isaac Julian's Young Soul Rebels. Unlike the crop of 1970s movies, Shaft and the like, made by whites to exploit black audiences, these were films made by blacks to explain the culture, the pride and the problems of black people. 
some of these movies were pretty rough and ready, but they will get better. The era of the black filmmaker has only just begun. But before we go on to any other discernible trends in the cinema this year, let's have a look at the eighth in my top ten list, Hamlet. Now, watching Mel Gibson at the beginning of the year in Air America, which provided one of his typical Mad Mel roles, you'd have thought that his idea of a soliloquy would have been to ask himself whether he should dispatch the next enemy with a gun or his bare hands. And yet, between them, he and director Franco Zeffirelli produced perhaps the clearest, most accessible version of Hamlet that the cinema has yet seen. <laughs> Are you honest? My lord? Are you fair? What means your lordship? That if you be honest and fair, your honesty should admit no discourse to your beauty. Could beauty, my lord, have better commerce than with honesty? I did love you once. Indeed, my lord. You made me believe so. You should not have believed me. I loved you not. Where's your father? At home, my lord. Let the doors be shut upon him, that he may play the fool nowhere but in his own house. If thou dost marry, I'll give thee this plague for thy dowry. Be thou as chaste as ice, as pure as snow, thou shalt not escape calumny. Or if thou wilt needs marry, marry a fool. For wise men know well enough what monsters you make of them. I have heard of your paintings well enough. God hath given you one face and you make yourselves another. You jig and amble and you lisp. You nickname God's creatures and make your wantonness your ignorance. Go, go, file no morons. It has made me mad. I say we will have no more marriage. Those that are married already, all but one shall live. The rest shall keep as they are. Not a bad little writer, that. Back now, though, to current cinema trends, and one that comes to mind is represented by the caring, sharing, touchy-feely mood represented in films like Regarding Henry, with Harrison Ford as a tough, wounded lawyer, seeing the error of his ways. City Slickers, Billy Crystal and friends finding themselves out on the range. Robin Hood, Kevin Costner delivering a baby in Sherwood Forest. Other People's Money, Danny DeVito as a Wall Street asset stripper with an unsuspected heart of gold. I mean, hey, what's going on here? Even Arnold Schwarzenegger turned up as a loving and protective, though still homicidal robot, in Terminator 2. Now, don't get me wrong, I have nothing at all against touchy, caring, feely sharing movies. But as one who's had to sit through films like Home Alone and Curly Sue, my spirits do tend to plummet when I contemplate the endless veins of schmaltz that Hollywood is likely to tap and undoubtedly will tap in this kind of subject. So let's get on to the ninth film in my top ten, a German picture called The Nasty Girl. This is a sharp but beautifully understated story in which a young provincial woman, Lena Stolzer, becomes a pariah when she writes and publishes an essay entitled My Hometown During the Third Reich. Suddenly, as the local guilty parties start to protect themselves and their reputations, all the bigotry that had sustained and nurtured Nazism comes to the fore again. And what had begun as a gently amusing and nostalgic reminiscence of Stoltz's life in her small, smug town becomes both frightening and intellectually very tough. Kommen Sie zurecht? Na, ich find nix gescheites. Was hätten Sie denn gern gescheites finden? Na ja, zum Beispiel über den Bürgermeister Zumtobel. Na, das ist unter vertraulich abgelegt. Das dürfen wir nicht herausgeben. Ich brauch's aber für meinen Schulaufsatz. Da müssen Sie sich die Genehmigung von der Witwe vom Zumtobel holen. Das ist die Schokoladenfabrik Zumtobel. Schauen Sie, in all den Kesseln da wird Schokolade gerührt. Mmh, das riecht vielleicht toll. Ah, das gehört alles der Familie Zumtobel. Und die Frau Zumtobel hat mich im April 1979 hierher bestellt. Ich habe mir gedacht, vielleicht hat sie ja noch die Akten von dem Prozess, den die Amis nach dem Krieg ihrem Mann gemacht haben. Sie sind das. Sie wollen von mir die Einwilligung, dass der ganze Schmutz und die ganzen Lügen über meinen Mann noch einmal breit ja, ich werden. Ich möchte nicht über die Lügen schreiben, ich wollte nur die Fakten irgendwie. Mein Mann hat sechs Jahre im Arbeitslager zubracht. Sechs Jahre und ist aus Gram gestorben. Das sind die Fakten. Und die anderen haben sich gut gehen lassen nach dem Krieg. Das sind die Fakten. Und jetzt schauen Sie, dass es weiterkommt. Entschuldigung, ich wollte Was? nicht so einen Aufsatz Aber schnell! Now, you may have noticed that so far there's not been a single British film in my top ten. 
This shouldn't be surprising because we hardly ever make films in this country and most of those we do make are earmarked from the start for TV. A country has the movie industry it deserves and we have a movie industry that managed to turn out a derisory 41 pictures in 1990 and an even more lamentable 30 in 1991. The reasons for this I don't even wish to discuss anymore. But the fact is that as a nation we don't really care about film. It may well be the most important art form of the 20th century. But what we say is, yes, very possibly, but let's leave that to the foreigners, shall we? True, we go to the cinema in ever-increasing numbers, but the films we choose to see are mostly American. It's very depressing, though occasionally there is just a little gleam of light. Ken Loach's Riff Raff, recently voted European Film of the Year, provided one such gleam. Truly Madly Deeply gave us another, and so did Peter Greenaway's vividly imaginative Prospero's books. And then there was the tenth film in my list, Mike Lee's Delightful Life is Sweet, a funny, touching, fly-on-the-wall look at the life and times of a lower, middle-class suburban family in London. Lovely performances by Alison Steadman, Jim Broadbent, Claire Skinner, and the funny, heart-rendingly anorexic Jane Horrocks. I and it, guess what? What? I woke up this morning, I felt a little bit what's it, you know, and I thought to myself, Oh, blimey. <laughs> Don't tell me I'm in the family way. <laughs> Jesus Christ. What's the family way supposed to mean? You know what it means. No, I know what pregnant means. You don't have to talk some rubbish. Well, silly little saying. Oh, shut up. You shut up. I was lying there, Andy. I thought to myself, oh, we'd love another little baby. <laughs> You're too old to have a baby, ain't you? Of course not. You may not be. I am. You wouldn't see me for dust, I tell you. <laughs> Oh, Andy, don't be rotten. Typical. Typical man. Oh, shut up. What do you know about men? Enough. Anyway, I thought to myself, oh, never mind. <laughs> I'll just have to wait till I'm a grandma. <laughs> You're going to have a long wait, yeah. Hey. Good one, then. Oh, that's nice. Stick a couple of brown paper bags over their heads. <laughs> Might be able to flog them off cheap, sight unseen. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, I'm not going to waste my life. No? What are you doing now, then? Contributing a great deal, aren't you? Sitting around on your ass all day. Yeah, well, I'm thinking about it. Oh, yeah, thinking about it. That's the easy bit, isn't it? Thinking about it. Anyone can do that. It's doing it's difficult. Bollocks. Nicola. Shame, though, isn't it? It was such lovely little Dolly What's it? Sitting there in the matching little outfits. My little Natalie and my little Nicola. <laughs> and now I look at them. I'll get the sick buckets. <laughs> And that's it. As I said at the beginning, my ten films are not listed in any order of merit or even chronology. From Serrano to Misery to Dances with Lambs, from The Silence of the Wolves to Thelma and the Nasty Girl and everything in between, they're simply the films I've enjoyed or admired most this year. If your choice is entirely different, fine. Like the man said, that's what makes horse races. I'll be back with Film 92 on January the 7th when the first programme will be built around an exclusive interview with Michelle Pfeiffer talking about her career and her role opposite Al Pacino in the forthcoming Frankie and Johnny. For now, however, I'll leave you with Cher's The Shoop Shoop Song and an all-dancing cast of hundreds. May I wish you all a happy and much more prosperous new year. Goodbye. Dance.